And when he shot it, I saw a flash. And so I had to pretend like I was dead. This was a spree killing as opposed to a serial murder, as opposed to a mass murder. Sheriff's office, 911. Warning Some stories discuss topics of suicide and self harm. The following stories tell the tale of three families that were nearly wiped out due to the horrific actions of others. We have a man who killed all but one member of a Texas family. A man who killed his wife and three children but says he doesn't remember it. And a Utah family that was wiped out in a horrific murder side. Sheriff's office, 911. Ma'am, uh -huh. there was a shootout at my house. Um, I don't know if she's alive in my house. I'm scared Where are you at? Um, 7142 Highway 70. It's about 13.3 miles out from the bowling alley. What's your name? Robin Downs, my parents. Um, Bill Conrad and Brian Conrad. I'm scared of this and I don't know what Robin to do. Robin Downs? Yes, ma'am. Brian I Conrad. I'm so alive. Okay, I'll stay on with you. <gasps> I've got the ambulance and the fire department to come to, okay? Thank you so much. You're coming. <laughs> other vehicles or strange people around your home or no, anything? No, ma'am. You didn't see a car drive off of any kind? No, ma'am. You just heard the shots fired? Then I heard, I saw the lights on in the kitchen, so I'm assuming they stole food stuff. Okay, okay. <gasps> I can't believe it. Okay, okay, okay. <sighs> and all I want right now is my blanket and my pillow. I'm scared. I know you are. I'm scared. I know. I know. Hey, right there. These are the terrified words of 10-year-old Robin Doan. Robin was an innocent little girl from Texas who was living a nice, normal life before everything got turned upside down one night when she was just sleeping in her bed. Robin had a different name than the parents she mentions on the 911 call because her mother, Michelle, ended up remarrying. She lived with her mom, her stepfather, Brian, and her older brother, Zach. Their family was very well liked and respected. They were like the perfect American family. Tragically, all that was ruined on the night of September 30th, 2005. Robin had gone to bed at night in her bed, as usual, only to be awoken around 3.50 a.m. to the sound of gunfire and screaming. Let's rewind back to the day before this tragedy occurred, September 29th, 2005. It was a good day for Robin that started out with a kind act from her father. Brian made me breakfast that morning and it was actually pancakes. Those are my favorite. But Robin had more to be excited about that particular day than just her breakfast surprise. Her mother was five months pregnant at the time and Robin could hardly wait to be a big sister. She had been looking forward to it for a long time. I was gonna be the greatest big sister ever. When we got home, my mom started trying on maternity clothes and there's these god-awful maternity stretchy pants. They were terrible. And then uh, that, was, that was all I remember. It was just the very next morning that Robin was calling 911 after believing she had heard someone trying to kill her whole family. Despite how much fear she was experiencing during the unimaginable circumstances, she still managed to remain calm and stay on the line with the dispatcher while she waited for help to arrive. What she couldn't have known at the time was how hard emergency officers were trying to get there as fast as humanly possible. I just couldn't get there fast enough. I could not get there fast enough. What in the world could have taken place and why is she the only one on the phone? I hear more sirens. Yes, they're coming. I've got the ambulance in the park coming for you. Okay? I know you do. I know. This is the real dash cam footage taken as one of the police officers pulled up to the Conrad family residence. Robin could not have been more relieved to see the officer arrive, so much so that she runs to embrace him. I'll never forget when I turned down the driveway. Oh, I see you, I see you. This child, she ran straight to me, I hugged her. As distraught as she was, she's very articulate, just telling me in, in absolute detail what was going on and what she heard and, and everything. 
Deputy Chad Brooks had no idea what tragic events had happened within the Conrad family house. His initial instinct is to try to protect Robin from whatever threat may remain on the property. He decides the best thing to do is to put Robin in his own patrol car and lock the doors while he checks out the house. The east door to the residence had been kicked in. Everything was in place. The coffee was set to come on the next morning. The whole house is eerily untouched, nothing stolen, nothing out of place. The police first enter the master bedroom where they come across an incredibly disturbing scene. Brian Conrad had been shot in the head three times while Michelle Conrad had been shot six times. But the tragedy didn't end there. They proceeded on to Robin's older brother, Zach's room, where they discovered him shot a few times. Whoever had done this clearly intended to be thorough because they even shot Molly, the family dog, two different times killing her. Robin was the sole survivor of this horrific tragedy and nobody has any clues whatsoever as to who could have done this. Chief Deputy looked at me and we looked at each other and he said, go be with that little girl. I said, is there anything I can do for you, Robin? And she said, I want to feed my animals. While Robin is permitted to do this, the officer surveys her bedroom. It's there that they find shell casings, yet somehow Robin hasn't been struck by either shot. She was completely unharmed. How that bullet missed Robin, I do not know. It struck a little drawer next to her bed. While the Conrad house must still be going through lots of testing for evidence, the police decide to take Robin away from the home to a child advocacy center. Here she will be able to answer questions about what she experienced and provide any information about what went down. While there, what she has to recount is recorded on camera. Despite being clearly terrified, she remains composed and expresses herself well while using a stuffed animal to comfort herself. Do you know why you're here today? We to talk about what happened this morning. I really don't want to go to sleep anymore. Okay. It makes me to where I'm too scared. I really don't want to go to sleep. Okay. So, okay. They asked me, what do you remember? Can you describe what he looked like? I don't know this for sure, but I thought I saw a white, white, white eyes. Okay. Okay. It was only a matter of time before police had to do the unimaginably painful job of bringing up the trauma that occurred the night before. Robin remembered it all clearly. She never hesitated in her answer of 15 shots. Through the course of the crime scene investigation, 15 fired rounds were found inside the home. And when he shot, I saw a flash. And so I had seen like I can't talk about it. It's, it's too heartbreaking. The Conrad family is not the kind of family that had enemies. If anything, they were the opposite. They were the kind of family you could simply rely on. They were good people. So who would have possibly wanted to destroy them in this horrible way? Nobody knew. We had no clue who this was. We had no idea who had done this, why it had happened, or where those people might possibly be. The police didn't have any form of DNA fingerprints to go off of. All they had were tire tracks, footprints, and the shell casings that were left in the home. There was also no known motive. What police didn't know at that time was that this crime was actually connected to one that occurred just 14 hours later in Pineville, Missouri. It was 10 in the morning and Missouri police received a notice of a double homicide. It came in that there were two people and they had both been shot. They had just come home from shopping. They still had bags of food in their hand. Once I stepped in, I found a bullet casing and saw a shell lying on the floor and saw Miss McCool downstairs. The victims were Orly and Dawn, and they were 70 and 47 years old, respectively. Dawn was Orly's daughter-in-law, and she had just been helping him get some groceries. It was clear that this was not a burglary, and at first it appeared as if nothing was missing from the house. A receipt in one of the shopping bags showed that the murders had just happened and that the two had not been dead for long. But yet again, there was no known motive for this crime. Eventually, police realized that something actually is missing from the home. It's Orly's Dodge truck. 
They report it as stolen into a nationwide system. We were looking at the ammo, the shell casings, and one of the other deputies there that does a lot of the crime scenes and said, I just took a burglar report. Well, Mr. King had reported that his son Levi had come into the house while he was gone and broke into his uh, gun safe and stole several guns. So now the police have a potential suspect, Levi King. The only problem is that Levi is gone and there's no telling who he might try to hurt next. Bulletin went out immediately. The uncertainty of having somebody driving around with that kind of a mindset, it's horrifying. Police don't know why Levi could be doing this. All they know is that he's on some sort of murderous rampage. Luckily, because so much of the public was now looking for Levi, someone managed to spot him. He was arrested and taken in for questioning. Levi King was found in the truck by the Border Patrol in El Paso. He admitted having guns in the back. Well, that drew their attention. While in custody, Levi straight out admitted to the double homicide in Missouri. How many times did you fire? So much. He, he spotted. If you walk by to the door and you see this woman, why, um, explain to me why you shot at her. I was scared. I was, I, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. You know, I was panicking. Levi appears calm, not like a guy who just shot and killed people. But in reality, we know that killers can come in all shapes and sizes. They don't always look how you would expect. He doesn't look bizarre, he's not dirty, he relates well, he's responsive. Uh, but the fundamental problem and deficit with a psychopath is a lack of attachment to other people. At this point in time, police have not connected Levi to the Conrad murders in Texas that just occurred after the McColl murders, and that case is sadly growing cold. There is no closure for Robin, who must have been terrified knowing that whoever killed her family may also kill her. At this point, we felt like we probably were not going to be able to solve this case. Luckily for them, Levi King decided to start talking and spilling the secrets. I had been told by a couple of the uh, detention officers there in the jail that, that Levi had asked to see me and speak with me. Levi is led out of his cell, and it is then that he decides to confess to the Conrad family murders. Levi King says, you know, there's four more in Texas. Nobody was hunting him, nobody was questioning him, so I don't know why he made that statement. It would later be determined that Levi first killed Don and Orly. He then stole Orly's truck and drove it 14 hours to Texas. That's when he broke into the Conrad home and killed everybody but Robin. His motivation, you might be wondering, he was mad at his dad. This was a spree killing as opposed to a serial murder, as opposed to a mass murder, where he kills and then in a very short period of time, he then killed again. The obvious question at hand is what kind of person could do something like this? Who could kill a bunch of people you don't even know, who have done nothing to you? It makes you want to take a look back at what kind of life Levi had. Levi was born in Missouri in 1982. He was one of seven kids and they lived in extreme poverty. They didn't have running water or electricity. They did, however, have lots and lots of ammunition. Levi's father was violent and he grew up to fear him. Levi quickly began to show signs of distressing behavior and even lit his sister's curtains on fire when he was four years old. But that's not all. His father would also fort him to shoot and kill his own pets. From the stories that we got, it was, wasn't at all unusual to hear automatic weapons fire coming, coming from the King House on the hill. The police were scared to go there. Levi started drinking alcohol when he was still a little kid and then later turned to a life of crime. And what was to become of him now? Robin and the rest of the victims needed justice. If there was ever a case where a man deserved to die, it was Levi King. I was 14, about to turn 15, when trial was taking place. I was gonna be sitting in front of a murderer who had killed my loved ones. And to testify, I didn't want to, but I knew that I needed to for my family's sake. I was the only one that got to walk out of that house. They didn't, and they needed a voice too. It's hard to imagine how Robin could have felt when she finally locked eyes with Levi. I 
tried to avoid looking at Levi King as long as I possibly could, and finally I couldn't resist the urge anymore because I wanted to see who had actually done this. And so I looked at him, and the stare that I got back was the worst feeling of my entire life. Robin had no choice but to recall the chilling details of the worst night of her life, the night that she lost her family. That night, I was having a nightmare, and I remember like hearing the gunshots in my dream, but like when I woke up, it didn't end. The gunshots were actually going off in my house. My mother started screaming, screaming and screaming and screaming. Robin initially got out of bed and went to the door, but when she heard footsteps heading towards her room, she decided to rush back to bed and pretend to be asleep. He fired two rounds at Robin and one of the bullets grazed her. He then entered her brother Zach's room and shot him. He fired two rounds off at me. I had one of them graze my left leg and my left arm. He turned and he opened up my brother's door. He flipped the light on and that's when he shot my brother. And I knew that my brother's really gone. Like I knew that there was no chance that he'd be alive. Robin spent two torturous hours pretending to be dead while she heard the intruder going through the drawers and cabinets of her home. She waited until it was finally quiet before she got out of bed and called 911. I just remember, like, adrenaline rushing through my body. Sheriff's office, 911. Ma'am, uh -huh. there was a shootout in my house. Um, I don't know who's alive in my house. Can you just please come out here? Somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. It felt like an eternity before they got there. I just remember running to the first to the first person that got out of that car, and I hugged him. He told me everything was going to be okay. They were going to figure it out. She kept holding on to hope that maybe one of her family members was going to come walking out of the house. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Eventually, the police officers must come and tell her the truth. Her family was all dead, even her dog. She burst into tears while recalling this horrific day in court. The hard part about Robin testifying was to see the pain that that precious little girl had to go through and endure. And then to see her say, I've endured this, but you're not taking my life away from me. I am not giving you that kind of control. Robin made the decision to forgive Levi and told him so in court. She did this so she would be able to heal and one day move forward. I don't want to live with being bitter and being angry all the time for what had happened. Me forgiving Levi King, it was my sense of peace and it was my sense of this is how I was raised and this is my family coming out. The jury deliberated for seven hours before deciding that Levi King should be sentenced to life in prison without parole. He was extradited to Missouri, which was comforting to Robin because she didn't want him to spend the rest of his life in the state that is home to her. Despite everything she has gone through, Robin is a very strong individual and has thrived. She doesn't want what happened to her to define her. The dates that are really hard are birthdays. Zach's birthday, mom's birthday, Brian's birthday. I don't expect you to pity me and I don't want you to because that's not how I am. I want to be just like everybody else. Robin takes a reminder of her older brother Zach everywhere she goes. It's a number 12 necklace. That's because 12 was Zach's baseball number. Robin is the face of survival and she wants others to know that it doesn't matter how much you've been through. You can get through it and prevail. I played basketball, I played volleyball, I played softball, ran track, uh, I was a cheerleader. I'm able to tell people there's nothing that you can't get through. Robin is pursuing a degree in nursing so that she can help other people. If you thought that story was crazy, wait until you hear this next one.
Anthony Tote is waking up behind bars this morning where he'll remain for the rest of his life. After hours of deliberation, the jury did finally find him guilty of murdering his entire family. And even after he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, Anthony Tote once again denied any responsibility. Tote's wife, Megan, their three kids, and the family dog were all found dead in their celebration home in 2020. This disturbing story takes place in Celebration, Florida. The Todd family appeared to be a happy, normal family on the outside. Both Anthony and Megan were physical therapists, and they had three beautiful children. They were successful and seemed happy, but there was much more than met the surface. Anthony would often travel to run his practice, while Megan would remain at home with the children. Around Thanksgiving of 2019, Anthony told his patients that his wife was sick and that he needed to travel home to care for her. He said he would reschedule their appointments for a different time. Back in celebration, the neighbors of the Tots family hadn't seen them in a while, but assumed they were just out of town. Meanwhile, Megan's aunt Cindy, whom she was really close to, was getting suspicious because Megan wasn't answering the phone. She claimed to be too sick to talk, but something didn't seem right, especially when Anthony texted Cindy to say that the whole family was going off the grid, and that's why she wouldn't be hearing from them. Eventually, Anthony's sister called the police to request a welfare check for the family. Um, I'm wondering if somebody can do a wellness check on my brother uh, and his family. They've been really sick for probably like the past week and a half. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can't seem to get a hold of them. The police did stop by the house, but nobody answered the door, and it seemed to them that the house was empty. The weeks passed by, and still nobody heard from the family. At this point, they were behind on rent, and people were getting really concerned. As family members dug deeper, they discovered that Anthony was actually in trouble with his physical therapy company for health insurance and insurance fraud. The FBI were looking for him so they could arrest him. They went to his house, and this time, he was there sitting on the front porch. He was then arrested. It wasn't until they entered the home that they found the rest of the Todd family all deceased. They found Megan lying on the master bed, and the children were lying dead on the mattress next to it. They had clearly been dead for weeks. The dog was also found deceased. Tony confessed to the murders. He also said he had taken a Benadryl in order to try to kill himself, so he was taken to the hospital. It was there that he was charged with four counts of first-degree murder and one count of animal cruelty. I'm Osceola County Sheriff Russ Gibson, and I wanted to give you the latest update uh, on the death investigation that occurred at 202 Reserve Place in Celebration. Deputies made contact with Anthony in the home along with federal agents, as he, and he was immediately detained. A safety check of the home was conducted where deputies discovered four deceased individuals inside. The home was immediately secured and a search warrant was obtained by our detectives. Anthony confessed to killing Megan and their three children, Alec, Tyler, and Zoe. But the main question remaining was why? It could have been tied to the investigation into his practice due to his illegal activity that he was seemingly hiding from Megan. The trial against him took place in September of 2021, and at this time, Anthony is taking back his earlier confession. He says he didn't kill anyone, and he was just drugged up at the time of the confession. He later made a call to his sister, Christy, from jail, in which he says he can't remember anything. What's up, Chief? Oh, it's good to hear your voice. I've been held in isolation, I still am. Are you okay? I am. I don't remember anything pretty much over Christmas and the first week I got here. I don't remember coming here. I don't remember anything. Um, after the events what happened and all that kind of stuff, I have no idea um, where I was, where I am. But would a jury believe this story? He was brought before a judge and told that he would be held without bond. While in custody, Anthony wrote a very long letter to his father in which he continued to claim his innocence. He claims his wife suffered from depression and that she had killed the kids and then killed herself. We know this is not true because her stab wounds were determined to be self-inflicted. But his story doesn't stop there. He also claims that his wife had a vision of the world ending due to a virus and that the nation was invaded. 
He thinks that this is why she would have killed the kids. His trial was held in 2022, and many tuned in to watch. It was quite bizarre. He took the stand to testify on his own behalf. He claims that prior to all of this happening, his wife tried to take her own life. Your countenance. My own demeanor, when I found out what happened, I puked. I cried. I was in total denial of what happened. I couldn't understand. And then after that, I was like, I want to get you help. When asked what he believes could have been done to prevent Megan from, as he alleged, killing their children, he said he didn't know. I had no, I had no knowledge of this. I, I don't know what could have prevented it. I have no idea. And that's the biggest thing that affects me is the fact that I didn't even see this coming. Ultimately, it would come down to the jury to decide if Anthony had really killed his family or if it had been his wife who did it. State of Florida versus Anthony John Tote. Verdict as to count one. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first degree murder as charged in the indictment. They would ultimately find him guilty on all counts, including the animal cruelty charge. He was then seen shaking his head after the verdict was read. It was determined that because Anthony clearly had some mental issues, the state decided not to seek the death penalty, but life in prison instead. At the sentencing hearing, Anthony continued to claim his innocence. I love my wife. I love my children. I was not there the night my children died. The judge did not hold back. You, Anthony John Tote, are a destroyer of worlds, that you destroyed the world of your four-year-old daughter, Zoe Elizabeth Tote, that you destroyed the world of your 10-year-old son, Tyler John Tote, that you destroyed the world of your 13-year-old son, Alexander John Tote, that you destroyed the world of your wife, Megan Denise Tote. Anthony was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. We've got one last story for you, and it's quite heartbreaking. So yesterday, January 4th, officers from the Enix City Police Department were summoned to 4923 North Albert Drive in reference to a welfare check. Concerned families and friends had contacted police earlier after not hearing from the, the, the people there. Officers entered the residence at approximately 4 p.m and discovered three adults and five minors deceased inside the home, and each appeared to have sustained gunshot wounds. This is the tragic story of the Haight family. Michael and Tasha Haight lived with their children in Laverkin, Utah. Their children ranged in age from four to 17 and included Macy, Breeley, Sienna, Amon, and Gavin. From the outside, they looked like a normal, happy family. But there was something dark happening behind closed doors. Several years prior to the events that led up to their murders, Michael Haight was investigated for child abuse. His oldest daughter, Macy, told the police that her father had been abusing her over the course of three years. She claimed that he would shake and choke her and had thrown her into the wooden back of a sofa. She also said she was afraid her father was going to kill her. He admitted that he got angry, but denied that his acts were abusive. He also admitted to regularly checking his wife's phone and iPad to see what she was doing online. Despite these things, he was not charged with the beats. Just two years later, Tasha filed for divorce. Five weeks after that was when the massacre took place. Because there weren't any survivors of this attack, nobody will ever know exactly what was said or what events transpired before the murders. All that is known is that it was likely sparked by Michael's displeasure over his looming divorce. What is known is that on January 4th of 2023, he shot and killed each of his five children, his wife, Tasha, and her mother, Gail, who was 78 years old. The murders occurred in their family home. He then turned the gun on himself and took his own life. The horrific murders sent a shock wave through the Utah community and particularly shocked the community of Latter-day Saints, a group that the family was heavily involved in. 
The children were remembered for their love of serving others, each one of them with a bright future ahead of them, before it was shockingly stolen away. The oldest, Macy, had plans to attend college at University of Southern Utah upon her graduation. Gavin, the youngest, at just four, was known for loving to draw and giving people hugs. Many turned up to show support to the family and say goodbye at the funeral. A huge outpouring of sympathy as more than 800 people paid their respects to seven members of an Enoch family who were victims of an apparent murder suicide last week. There have been so many involved in this process of recovery. Seven hearses line the parking lot of the Laverkin Stake Center of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's a story of two families hurt and broken through an unthinkable tragedy. An emotional day as Tasha Haight, her mother Gail Earl, and Tasha's five children, ages four to 17 years old, were all laid to rest. This comes after police say Tasha's husband and father to her children, Michael, shot and killed them last week before ultimately turning the gun on himself. Tasha's brother, Brett, came forward the day of the funeral to thank friends and members of the community who had been praying for them during this unimaginable time. We want you to know that we felt them. And they have sustained us. And so there we have it. Three tragic stories of families being destroyed under the most horrific and unimaginable terms. May the souls of each of these victims rest peacefully.